Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this annual meeting of the New Champions um, discussion on the prosperity and security along the modern Silk Road. Um, my name is Charlie Campbell. I'm the Beijing correspondent for Time magazine. Um, by way of short introduction, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative was first announced by President Xi Jinping in 2013, um, and today has grown into a $900 billion trade and infrastructure network spanning Europe, um, Central Asia, South Asia, and down through Africa as well. It's incredibly ambitious, and the Belt and Road covers over half the global population, uh, three quarters of its energy resources, and about 40% of GDP. Um, China is spending roughly $150 billion a year across the 68 nations which have signed up to the initiative. These, this money is being spent on ports, high-speed so high railways, roads, power plants, and all sorts of modernization designed to spur growth. Um, but there are challenges, of course. Um, the Silk Road passes through some of the most uh, unstable and uh, um, poorest parts of the world. And at the uh, Belt and Road Forum last month, President Xi himself said, the countries along the ancient Silk Road were once places with milk and honey, but now are full of turbulence, conflicts, and crisis. Um, today, we have a, a fantastic panel, which is definitely full of milk and honey. Um, um, on my left, we have Professor Yang Shui-Tong from Tsinghua University's um, um, Institute of uh, International Relations. Uh, we have uh, Munir Kamal, um, who is the board member, a board member of the Engro Corporation Limited and chairman of the Pakistan Stock Exchange. He started his career at Citibank. Um, we have Simon O'Connell, um, executive director with the Mercy Corps, a global humanitarian aid agency. And we have uh, Kevin Liu, um, Asia Chairman of Partners Group, um, a global um, investment uh, management firm, and formerly of the World Bank. Um, Professor Yan, maybe I could start off um, with you. Um, could you please tell us a little bit how this project has developed over time from its uh, conception? OK. And yesterday, I attended a panel. I uh, listened to a Japanese panelist uh, uh, suggest that the one by one road is the Chinese uh, uh, strategy. And the, so this strategy possibly may uh, require others to uh, support China's uh, uh, desire. And actually, I think uh, there's a kind of a confusing about uh, what the one by one road is. And uh, you find that uh, there's uh, two terms. One is uh, initiation, the other is a strategy. So pe if it is a strategy, that's, that means uh, what is designed by the Chinese government. And if it's an initiation, that means just a suggestion for others to, co to cooperate with. And from my understanding, because China initiated this project, and this idea, so certainly China has the, its own, own plan. So uh, domestically, they use the term strategy. But that when they're talking about the foreign audience, and you need the, uh, to develop the cooperation with others, so they use the uh, initiation. I think now it's a clear, and when we use the strategy, when we use the term the, uh, initiation. And actually, the one by one road, and uh, from my understanding, is uh, ec uh, economic, by now, because it's already open to the all over the world, it's open to everyone, so it's almost a Chinese term of the globalization, mm -hmm. it's a one by one road. And it started from, uh, actually, from the Central Asia. It's not. Uh, at the very beginning is a global uh, thinking or glo uh, idea for globalization. At the very, very beginning, this is a concern how to strengthen the strategic relationship between China and uh, uh, Central Asia countries. We already have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We have very good strategic cooperation on, uh, in terms of the security, but the economic relationship is a is a quite a backward, cannot support that kind of strategic cooperation. So the Chinese government suggests that, hey, uh, we should and uh, look, uh, find our approach to enlarge our economic relationship with the Central Asia. That's the very <coughs> beginning about the one, one belt of the uh, Silk, Road, uh, uh, Silk Road. So at that time, only concerned the pipeline and transportation and the uh, trade, these things. But then gradually it developed into not only Central Asia and also towards the uh, Southeast Asia. It's called the maritime and uh, Silk Road. And uh, 
Now, gradually, when this idea was uh, accepted by more and more countries, not only in the surrounding area, but beyond this region, like the UK and the very, very west, and New Zealand and the very, very east of the China, <laughs> then China, and also open it to Japan, to the uh, US, to everyone. So by now, I, I think this one by one road is almost like the Chinese uh, uh, term or, the, uh, uh, or the, 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 the special concept for uh, globalization. I see. And you mentioned that the project has grown and morphed since it was first uh, conceived in 2013. Um, in 2013, the geo-economic geo parameters were very different. Commodity prices were very high, um, but now they're much lower. Um, can I, Kevin Liu, can I just ask you whether you think that um, a lot of the projects which are involved with the Belt and Road Initiative, do they make financial sense today, or is there political pressure which is pushing through a lot of stuff which perhaps wouldn't have happened otherwise? Thank you, Charlie. Let me maybe first to, to <coughs> echo a little bit what, uh, what mm -hmm. Professor Yan has talked about, the nature of the Belt Road uh, concept, and I'll come to the, the financial okay. question, right? So I, I would go even a step further. I think, I think, I think the Belt Road sort of theme is, is definitely not a strategy or master plan. For me, it's a state of mind. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a state of mind to encourage people to think about the value of connectivity, yeah. right? I think the, the, yeah. the main points are two, in my mind, Beijing is trying to make. One is that connectivity is going to benefit every, everybody who got connected, you know, through trade, through the capital flow, through people, through ideas, right? When, when you have those connectivity, it benefits everybody, not only China, but obviously China is playing an important role in that, in that framework. But second, I think the way I, my speculation is that when you term such a state of mind using a very ancient phrase, it reminds people this is nothing new. People have done that before thousands of years ago. If our ancient ancestors understood the value of connectivity, there's no reason for us today, hopefully we were smarter than our, than our ancestors, to not understand that. Right. To me, it's about connectivity. It's about the fact that this is not an earth-shattering you know, new concept. Right. So it's a state of mind. It's not a master plan. It's about connectivity. Right. An interesting anecdote was, I think, I think it's two years ago, actually, in Dalian, I was, um, I, was, uh, I was in a conversation with one of the head of state in Asia. I, I, I will not name that. And, and, uh, and he was quite concerned. At that point, I think the One Belt, One Road concept was not as fully articulated as it was today, as Professor Yen said. Now it includes a very large group of countries. So this particular country is very close to China, but is not, was not technically on the Silk Road. So he was concerned. So the, the prime minister said, wow, well, our country was not on the Silk Road. You know, should I worry about it, right? So I made the exact point to him. I said, look, this is about connectivity. I don't think it's about you know, thousands of years ago whether your country happened to be on that particular road. Right? So going, going to your question, Charlie, on, on the financial side, right? my personal view is, is the following. I think when you look at the financial or economic aspects of all these infrastructure projects, uh, by the way, my firm, uh, Partners Group, is a Swiss private equity firm. We actually invest about $10 billion in infrastructure. Right? And we do look at those projects. The way I have, uh, uh, when we look at those, uh, those assets, is that I think you have to look a little bit broader, right? When you look at the economic feasibility of an infrastructure project, particularly infrastructure project, as opposed to a typical private equity deal, is that you got to look beyond the immediate cash flow feasibility, right? You got to look for the economic feasibility, the, 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 the social economic angles as well. I think that applies particularly in this case, right? When you have those projects in probably some of the countries in Central Asia, for example, which may not be a mainstream destination for private investors, I think the role for government to come in to essentially complete that financial calculation beyond the immediate cash flow is very important. Well, what I meant is, for example, you know, which, uh, what type of government guarantee Pakistan should offer the investors in order to lower their risk. Because, because if you don't do that, just purely on a cash flow basis, the equations may not work for the investors. So that's the, a that's the point I will make for now, which is when you evaluate this project, you got to look broader at the, the role of the government to either reduce the risk or to beef up the return is very important for the investors. 
Okay. And you mentioned Pakistan, and one of the keynote projects of the Belt and Road Initiative is the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a $50 billion um, sort of corridor of uh, pipelines and roads and railways. Um, makes sense on both sides. Um, for China, it means they can um, cut the time to transporting goods from eastern Chinese factories from 12 days to 36, 36 hours. And obviously, the um, power plants can help solve Pakistan's uh, dire energy crisis, which I believe cuts off around 6% of GDP. Um, so, uh, Mr. Kamal, um, what are the, the security problems which undermine the possibility of the, the, the corridor being a success? First of all, let me take you a little behind. Uh, Pakistan and China constructed a 800, km, 800 miles long uh, highway, uh, commonly known as Karakoram Highway, started from um, the Chinese uh, province of Xinjiang. Um, uh, and coming down to just about 100 miles away from um, the capital, Islamabad. And this went through, uh, passed through some of the most treacherous and uh, you know, difficult areas, and the construction cost 500 Chinese and Pakistani lives. It was inaugurated in 1982. Um, so given this past, nobody should be surprised that one of the flagship projects of One Belt, One Road is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor because we've done it before, similar track. The difference this time is the scale. Mm. Um, 45 to $50 billion, you're absolutely right. But the bulk of this, around 35 or $36 billion, are the energy projects, which have, which is a Pakistani desire, not a Chinese desire. And I think I heard the Prime Minister of China say that we would like to, for this project, we'd like to see what are the local requirements. So this 35 billion out of 45 or 50 is purely Pakistani need, we have identified. To answer some of your questions, all of these projects are built on business feasibilities. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, instead of lowering the risk, we have enhanced the returns. So the, from the equity point of view, the Pakistani and the Chinese counterparts have collaborated. This is like any other project finance, but the returns are rather rich to indict, to induce the Chinese private sector and the public sector to come inside. So $35 billion is that. The remaining is, of course, the infrastructure development. The road this time does not stop 100 miles away from Islamabad. It comes all the way south to the port city of uh, Gawadar, which you're absolutely right, will cut down. But not only that, it gives access to China directly in a very short period of time, access to the Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean which are creating some anxieties in some of the other countries as well, that you know, this can be used as a military. I don't know about that. So success of CPAC will depend on following. One, and I, I think it's the right way to start as a flagship career. Pakistan and China have had an incredible five decades plus relationship on political, diplomatic, and military level. As we speak through this corridor, we are enhancing a massive economic relationship as well. Now, because of the relationship, sometimes you will hear people talk about experience in Africa or experience in Venezuela. It's absolutely absurd to compare with Pakistan because, again, I would emphasize that Pakistan and China have had an incredibly good relationship. So hopefully, because of that past, the success of CPAC, which is absolutely imperative to tell the world how the One Belt, One Road will succeed. Now, why do I feel that this is moving towards success? Because Pakistan has challenges. You can't talk about Pakistan unless you address the issue of terrorism. And Pakistan have had an incredibly bad terrorist activities going on, more than 50,000 casualties in the streets of Pakistan. There are more than 6,000 military personnel casualties. But the good news is, since 2013, there have been a major success against terrorism. If you look at any internet site and see the casualty numbers, the bombing incident, the suicide bombing, it is coming dramatically down in Pakistan. And the reason why we are succeeding is very simple. The military, which is a very strong military, at times intrusive in the civilian affairs, but a very, very strong military, all the relevant political leadership of the parties and a very large portion of the population is saying this is the right way to go. That's one reason why we are succeeding. Have we won this war? Far from it. Long time to go. And this is going to be a challenge and success of CPEC. But I can very confidently state at this point in time that Pakistan has succeeded in its fight against terror. But I wish that was the only way to succeed in this whole region, and Pakistan specifically. We cannot have a normal Pakistan or a normal region unless Afghanistan is resolved. 
And I think, Professor, you talked about SEO, Sengai Cooperation. That is the body that should take it up, because that was started by Central Asian countries, China and Russia. This June, Pakistan and India have joined. It's very significant. Eventually, like you said, India would become part of that. It should become part of China. Uh, Iran, another very restive country. Who knows what will happen there? So it's a very dicey region from that point of view. And I think SEO and China, uh, Afghanistan and Iran, by the way, are the, are the observer stat states for SEO. And SEO was started for security concerns of the region. So I think one of the platforms that is available, China, Russia, Pakistan, India, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and observer status of Iran and Afghanistan, this should be used because unless we address the security concerns of the region, neither CPAC will have full advantage nor the region will see success of overall. Absolutely. And um, Pakistan is one of the most robust partners with China yeah. regarding um, One Belt, One Road. Um, and there's a lot of trust there. There's a lot of Pakistanis learning Chinese and, and seeing the advantages there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Simon O'Connell, how, uh, how, how important is trust on the ground for the local communities um, to partner with government in, um, infrastructure investment to make sure that the, the most vulnerable in the communities benefit? Yeah, great. Morning, morning, Charlie. Morning, Aaron. Um, so it's great you pick up on that word, trust. I, I, I know the general wisdom of these, um, these events is you need three key points to, to really hammer home, but my one key point is really this one word, this word of, of trust. Um, and I can't emphasize enough, you know, just the extraordinary times we're living in, this trust deficit, um, and at the same time, this extraordinary escalation in global humanitarian need. Um, and this lack of trust is forcing countries to retreat. It's breeding uh, nativist and populist sentiment. And that's, we're seeing that play out in a number of ways. So in the US, the US spends around uh, $52 billion on foreign development assistance. There's a threat of a 30% cut in that assistance. We are seeing some governments talk about recounting official development assistance in in different ways. And this is all playing out at a time when there's over 65 million people displaced globally. There are 1,000 refugees fleeing from South Sudan to Uganda every single day. There is a famine declared in South Sudan, and there are four famines, three other famines looming, Nigeria, Yemen, and Somalia. And so unless we find mechanisms to reestablish trust, and for countries to align and come together to intervene and to truly make a difference in these very, very challenging setting, set settings, we're going to breed and spread further fragility. And so on the positive front, what we're seeing is China established things like the South-South mechanism, a South-South fund of up to $3 billion to invest in some of those One Belt, One Road countries. But of course, it's important to remember that it's not just those countries that need the assistance. I talked about South Sudan. Uganda is on the One Belt, One Road list of countries. But how can we ensure there's more equitable investment into countries neighboring Uganda, such as South Sudan, such as the Central African Republic? We need to do that by working in partnership with civil society organizations, such as my own Mercy Corps, in partnership with government and private sector and if we truly form these coalitions and partnerships, you talked, um, Mr. Kamal, about risk. We de-risk yeah. by forming these cross-sector collaborations. I think that's one way we will go about reducing um, the fragility and spreading further trust in investment in those contexts. I see. And, and picking up on the idea of trust, um, China has for a long time had a soft power deficit, I think it's fair to say. Um, and it is in um, disputes with many of its neighbors over the South China Sea. Uh, Professor Yan, do you think Beijing is seeing this as a problem and uh, making positive steps to address it? Well, uh, in China, there's a, a kind of a, a philosophical belief. And if we develop economic cooperation with other countries, and then we can automatically improve our strategic relationship with others. That's why a lot of people believe if we uh, imp uh, can uh, successfully implement the uh, one by one road projects and we will uh, improve our relationship with all neighbors. But from my understanding, uh, that is not my personal view. And if you look at our economic relationship with uh, uh, Japan and the US, 
and they are all our largest trade partner and economic uh, uh, partner, but then our strategic relationship uh, cannot be uh, in consistency or with our economic relationship. So my understanding, China by, at this moment still regarded the one by one road as the economic pro program. And uh, even you, you listen to the Xi Jinping's speech at the Davos, in the winter Davos, he used the term as uh, economic globalization. And in China, there's a distinction between the globalization and the economic globalization. Globalization including political globalization, military globalization, and even the negative sides of globalization, like terrorist globalization, and the pollution globalization, and the smuggling globalization, and the uh, uh, or even the, the uh, drug dealers globalization. So in China, we use the term very cautiously. We said that the economic globalization refers to free trade, free investment, free uh, flow of the technology, and the, uh, uh, at most the labors. So from my understanding, China still concerned the uh, uh, one by one road as economic program, not related to the security and the po uh, political, uh, uh, political uh, concern. And the second, and because it regarded the one by one road as an economic uh, uh, program, so it's closely related to our economic plan. And uh, at the very beginning, just now I forget to mention, actually at the very beginning, the one belt, uh, the one, one belt of the Silk Road related to so-called the Western development. In the Western area of the China is very backward. So we, domestically, we have a plan to develop the Western part of this uh, 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 country. So how can we do? We can say, okay, let this the economic development, the domestic development in the Western region connected with the Central Asia. That's the very beginning. Now, from my understanding, China defined the one by one road as the economic program is concerned how China's economic relationship with the outside get closer. But this time a little bit different from the 1980s. 1980s, we try to get the foreign capital technology and the uh, goods come into China, right? Now we said we should do that uh, two directions, and the uh, the, the uh, 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 two uh, uh, two tri uh, no a two direction tribe. So that means that we should have Chinese capital, technology, and the investment and the goods uh, uh, go abroad. So that's my understanding. Yeah. This. Um, we've seen quite a lot of um, Chinese investment in the region. Um, but not all of it is, is working out as planned. Um, we, we see that the Lao um, Railway, which I think is meant to cost $7 billion, um, which is over half of the national GDP. Um, you also see the um, um, Hanban Tota port in um, Sri Lanka, which is at $8 billion, and the Sri Lankan government is trying to um, sort of, um, uh, rework that loan. Um, Kevin Liu, is there a, a danger that some of these investments, if they do not um, work financially and do not um, help the local population, could actually um, prove problematic for China's role in the region in the long run? I think as a, as a financial investor, right, I will say that uh, when we invest in a portfolio of assets, uh, we never expect every one of the assets will perform. I think as an investor, what we try to do for, for our LPs is to make sure that portfolio will perform on an overall basis. So using that analogy for the, the assets you, you mentioned about, I'm sure there will be some projects which, which could be labeled as under this framework of one belt, one road, will not perform. And uh, I think that's, that's almost a given. And uh, I think it's also a given that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that media will focus on those projects rather than the other projects which will perform, right? So, so to me, I'm not particularly alarmed by, by those things, which does not mean people should not give more care to the economic business feasibility angle of those projects, right? So I think the key, as Professor Yen already mentioned, um, is that if you look at globalization, right, I think I, I do agree. I think President Xi was very, very intent on using those frames. He repeated that probably 30 times. Yeah. He <laughs> never mentioned globalization by itself. He always said economic no. globalization yes. in his Davos speech, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the point here is that the, the security, political, di diplomatic dimensions of globalization are much more controversial. You know, when you talk about those globalization, I think 
in, in the case of China, there will be friends who like that of, the, of those angle, but there will be other countries who don't want that, right? But when you talk about a narrow version of economic connectivity, of benefits of doing business with each other, that is almost a very non-controversial topic in my view, right? So therefore, I think that explains why, in spite of the possibility that some of the assets may or may not perform commercially, you feel an extreme high level of excitement of the countries that are involved. I was in Azerbaijan a few months ago, uh, having dinner with a friend in one of those ancient caravans, right, where the camels stay, some rooms, and, and I asked him, I said, what do you think? You guys are going to be on the sort of receiving end of this framework, and, uh, and he said, this is fantastic. He said, look, the way he thought of it is the Asian Silk Road is, is the transport line, and it's dotted by hotels, he said, right? So every city is a hotel. He said, like Tehran is a five-star hotel of this part, and Baku used to be a two-star hotel. But he said, by China now inventing this framework, reinventing this framework, we hope to upgrade Baku to be a four-star hotel, right? Then you can charge more prices to your guests, you get more camels to come, or now probably no longer camels, but something else. So I think the excitement of that economic dimension is, is, is almost uh, non-controversial, right? But I think the other angle, those, those areas fall into Professor Yan's sphere, are going to be, naturally, going to be more controversial. But the key, maybe my, my last comment on this is that, the key is, if you look at China today, right, what we talk about in the, in the, in the 20 years ago, uh, the, the relationship between China, economic relationship between China and outside is really attracting investment into China. But today, for us as a global investor, we actually place much more focus on getting the capital in China elsewhere or buying overseas assets then somehow find value cre creation angles in China, right? So the economic gravity that China uh, commands today can be beneficial to many parties if you know how to play it. It's not only about putting money in China to buy an asset in China. And then under that framework or mindset of connectivity, I think those angles can be explored in a much more fuller way. Okay. I mean, you said that globalization isn't controversial, but I think the one place where it is controversial today is in the United States, where um, there's been a distinct shift away from that. Um, Mr. Kamal, you, the US is a major security partner with Pakistan. Um, and it's, it's, I believe it's going to send even more troops there in the future. Yeah. Um, how does the shifting dynamic in the US affect the, the possible success of the China-Pakistan economic corridor? Yeah. As I said earlier, it's absolutely important for the security of the region and within Pakistan. Within Pakistan, it's Pakistan's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about CPAC is that there's a searchlight on Pakistan. There's a 45 to $50 billion project. There is a debate that has already started within the country whether our economy is on track, when the repayments come, whether we'll be able to repay all the loans that are coming on the projects. So that's a very healthy debate that has started within the country. And the government is also focused on to fix the economy. The good news is the economy has done fabulously well in the last three years, four years. I represent stock exchange with the best performing stock market of Asia in 2016. We now have three Chinese stock exchanges, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and China Future, which is 30% owner of Pakistan stock exchange. So already there is an investment coming in Pakistan. Now, going back to the security situation, absolutely imperative that Afghanistan needs to be fixed for the region, for the whole success of at least to the Central Asia and Pakistan. And you're absolutely right. Traditionally, it's been American interest. And you're absolutely right again that 5,000 more troops, I think, President Trump committed to send back to Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is slowly getting attention of the new administration. We still don't know what is their strategy, how to fix Afghanistan. But the problem, the point is, that now it is an interest of China to be interested in the future of Afghanistan. Previously, they could take a back seat. Not anymore if they want Obar to succeed, uh, both in the Central Asia and Pakistan. So let's see how the Chinese will react to the. I have seen recently Russians are getting more interested. There is a body where Pakistan, China, and Russia meet and discuss Afghanistan. But as I said, this needs to be expanded. I would love to see SCO getting really interested in this thing because there were security issues that started SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and we need to deal with the United States of America. But most importantly, it is it's Pakistan's responsibility 
to make sure, because they are the neighbors, everybody can walk away. You were talking about refugees, sir. 24 December 1979, when the Soviet troops pulled into China, even today, after 37 years of conflict, we have on an average 4 million Afghan refugees living in Pakistan, even today. So the trust thing, you're absolutely right. So they need to go back to a country. They'll only go back to a country if it is peaceful. It's a very complex problem. Again, I will repeat, United States of America, China, Pakistan, Russia, and SCO, along with India and uh, Iran, uh, have interest in Afghanistan. It's a complex one. But I think with the renewed interest of China, China has to, and I'm sure they're taking more interest, uh, we should see some improvements coming along. But we still don't know what Mr. Trump wants to do in Afghanistan. It's yet to be seen. As in most of the cases, it is too new to the game. Let's see how he reacts. Okay. And you brought up trust again. Um, Simon O'Connell, um, I'm just wondering, because you've worked in Africa for a long time, and over 20 countries, I understand, um, and China is heavily invested in Africa, um, and it's had quite a bad press, somewhat unfairly, I think, um, about some of its investments. Um, from your experience, have Chinese investments in um, Africa had a positive effect? Yeah, absolutely. I spent um, three years of my life working and living in Ethiopia. I've seen some of the road and the infrastructure developments connecting uh, arid pastoral lands to uh, the highlands of Ethiopia and the economic benefits that that brings about. I spent a lot of time in both Sudan and South Sudan. Again, some of that infrastructure is desperately needed. And in fact, more, more is needed. But I want to go back to this, um, this point about globalization. So it's not just the economy, which is global, but it's information, right? And increasingly, we're seeing uh, it, it play out. So there's, there's a burgeoning middle class in many countries in Africa. Kenya comes first and foremost to mind. Uh, and with that, there's uh, increasing economic development, increasing activity, and yet there's incredible fragility right next door in Somalia, in South Sudan, in the Central African Republic. And those people living in those really, really fragile environments, they're aware of that opportunity in countries like Nairobi. They're aware of all the changes taking place, and they want access to that opportunity as well. It's often framed around disparity, but I prefer to talk about this inequity of opportunity. And I think whilst China has uh, invested hugely in many of the countries I've lived in in Africa, and a lot of that has been the sort of hardware side of things, the more that China now starts to engage in the softer side, in building coalitions, in mobilizing Chinese civil society. We've been working here in China since 2001 with the China Foundation for Poverty Alleviation. We're now helping them to work overseas in countries like Ethiopia and Uganda and Myanmar and Nepal and, and several others. China needs to invest more and more in those civil society organizations and to bring them with them on this journey to be more international and forward facing. Okay. Um, Professor Yang, can I just ask you, um, a lot of these investments um, around the world for um, China are going to expose China to a lot of debt. Do you think this, and do you think there's going to be a sea change on the part of the Chinese government where it's going to be more active in protecting some of, his, of these investments? If you're talking about investments in Africa where there is unrest or in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, are we going to see Chinese troops on the ground in these countries? I, I think there's a lot of worries about this. And you find that just now we watched a map and then by the, uh, the, the what, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And it shows that the on the map, uh, from the satellite map of the lads, and the uh, uh, one by one road always at the darker area. That means uh, for the last 5,000 years, these regions are less developed. Mm -hmm. And so that's really difficult. Can the one by one road project make these places uh, uh, as, dark, uh, as uh, bright as the other area? And uh, no one knows. But anyhow, at this moment, uh, people really worry about this uh, investment in this region. That's why people concern that joint venture is best. That means uh, China and the partners uh, share the uh, risk. This is most important. Because of this, uh, most of the projects uh, is beyond our border. It's beyond the control of the PLA. And you cannot guarantee the uh, fiscal security. And uh, certainly, and also because investing in the foreign countries, and you must concern the security of the finance. This, uh, the capital. So who can provide this kind of security? You, for my understanding, you heavily rely on the local government. And I don't think 
there's no international institution to provide the security uh, sub, uh, uh, guarantee, and Chinese government cannot guarantee this. And so you have to rely on the, uh, uh, the local government. From my understanding, the currently, the uh, Pakistani government has already enrolled more troops to protect this one, uh, one belt, uh, the, no, uh, Pakistan uh, corridor. Sure. And uh, so you see from my understanding, the security is a really big issue. And that's why people are uh, concerned that uh, we need the very serious efficiency studies before to invest on these uh, projects. But by now, from my understanding, some projects are already and, uh, uh, launched, started. And uh, maybe in just uh, two years, uh, some project uh, can be uh, implemented. Okay. So, uh, Kevin Lee, just to turn a little bit to the, um, the US again. Um, the US has not been a, in favor of the One But One Road project generally. And the Obama administration campaigned against allies joining um, the, the AIIB. Um, and I think it's over 80 countries have already joined. Um, do you think that, depending on the, the success of One Belt, One Road, that America may get involved, or is it too early to tell with the Trump administration? I, I actually, I, I watched the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the establishment of AIB very closely. I used to work for the World Bank, right? So this is essentially a new World Bank sort of headed you know, by China, in a sense, right? So we were, it was a little bit of competitor to my former employer, so that's why I took a lot of interest. I, I have absolutely no doubt that uh, you can mark my words here, right? If, if, if three years from now, uh, we're still sitting here, I, I, I think, I, I will bet actually the US will become a member in three years. In three years? Yeah, in three years. I, I, because I think it's very simple, right? If you look at whether it's AIIB or the One Belt, One, one Road strategy, again, you have two angles. You have the economic fundamentals and you have the other political security soft bar angle. I think the, the second bucket will never be agreed on by everybody because everybody has their people, countries have divergent security political ideas, but the economic fundamentals are just very overwhelming, right? And, and, and here, when you talk about the, the, the economic gravity of China, this is very different from the gravity that the US has enjoyed for many years, right? I think the, the political economic gravity the United States has enjoyed over many decades is, um, is a more complex one. It's, it's not only the size of the market, it's not only the, the, the fundamentals, it also has to do with the soft power, Hollywood, culture, mindset, the idea of, of, of America, right? So I think the US global leadership is based on a much more complex set of things. And while China's gravity is based on, in my view, very simply about a very large economy, right? You have, you have, you have uh, this 1.4 billion people here that needs to consume, they need to invest, they, they will grow old, and they need education. So to me, it's a much simpler proposition to, to realize the economic gravity of China is here to stay and is here to grow. So from that angle, I think anything that's consistent with that it's easier to predict. Anything that's against that is, is also very easier to So that's why I, I would argue many countries, I would argue in, including the United States, if they, can, if they can get over their initial sort of geopolitical calculations and understand this is fundamentally an economic gravity topic, they will be part of this mutually beneficial mindset, again, in my view. This is not a coalition. This is not to join a, a new global five-year plan of China's. Right? I, I also hope China handles it that way. Right? So for those projects, um, I hope people don't interpret it that this is a master plan. Therefore, we have to do projects no matter what. I hope they take this as a state of mind and then exploit opportunities under this state of mind. Okay. Um, right now, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience, if anyone has any. I'm just right there, sorry. Please, could you um, introduce yourself and let us know who in the panel? I work for the Straits Times of Singapore. Uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, one for Prof. Uh, uh, so, one of the things that we noticed over the years is that uh, China has become very good at handling the WTO processes, you know, the dispute settlement mechanism and all that. You've been very effective in that. But yet, when it came to the South China Sea, you didn't want any international arbitration. You just completely dismissed the rulings of The Hague. Uh, could you explain this uh, apparent uh, uh, contradiction in your, uh, in your positions? And uh, for Mr. Kamal, may I ask yourself, uh, 
what you just said. Um, uh, in a sense, are you turning your back on the, uh, you know, coming from an ASEAN perspective, are you turning your back on the South Asian Association of uh, Regional Cooperation? Uh, because there's another big economy growing right next to you, and uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, you know, uh, India's strength today lies in the services economy, uh, which seems to have bypassed your economy in a sense, and there would have been a lot to gain by working together, for instance, in the uh, outsourcing industry, which seems uh, to, uh, you know, you're, you're completely missed. Thank you, sir. Um, okay. Professor, would you like to start? Well, I think uh, every country can uh, solve their problem based on two uh, approaches, bilateral or the multilateral. And so whether they adopt the bilateral approach or multilateral approach depends on the uh, issue itself. For instance, I never heard Japan and Russia invi inv invited any third party or the international organizations or, or organize a multilateral uh, forum to settle down the territory disputes between these two countries. And I don't think any journalist would raise question to Japanese uh, uh, panelists, uh, hey, why do you not solve your territory disputes with Russia by, uh, by uh, to the multilateral organizations? So that depends. Depends on whether our uh, problem with uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, South China Sea related countries and it's bilateral or the multilateral. For instance, we have uh, some uh, uh, maritime disputes with the uh, uh, Philippines. It had nothing to do related with third party. And certain that islands we should uh, uh, settle down bilaterally. And we also have the a, a, a problem with Vietnam, and meanwhile, the, uh, Malaysia and also claim they have a sovereignty over it. And so this is three countries uh, uh, problem. So we can, uh, we can start to solve the problem uh, through the bilateral approach. That means I have a trilateral discussion about this. So China's policy towards South China Sea is very clear. Depends on this uh, uh, specific conflict. It's a bilateral issue or multilateral issue. So China never rule out multilateral solution. So if these uh, islands uh, and uh, uh, related to three countries uh, claim, territor territorial claim, we will, uh, we will solve the multilateral issue. So I think there's a misunderstanding about the China's uh, policy towards South China Sea. And the second question is about uh, China's uh, uh, policy in the uh, uh, World Trade Organization. That's true. And in, uh, uh, World Trade Organization and the, when, uh, there's already some regulation. How to solve these uh, bilateral and multilateral regulations, you can do it. But by now, I don't think uh, we have this uh, kind of uh, organization or regulation to govern the territory disputes in the world. We don't have the, such kind of norms and the regulations. How, that means uh, who you can res uh, return to for help. So that's why there's a difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me start by saying Pakistan is a very lucky country in many ways. One of the things is that we have two huge neighbors, both one billion plus population. One of the neighbors, uh, neighbor China, uh, and we, as I said, we've had an incredibly unique relationship over the last five decades. Just our luck that neighbor of ours is going to be the largest single economy in a couple of decades, I think. Uh, and, and we are <coughs> really, uh, as I said, we are now taking that relation to another level, it's going to be a huge economic relationship. We would love to have a massive economic relationship with India as well. From a Pakistani perspective, from the business perspective, because I represent business ones, Pakistani businessmen would love to trade with India. And we had a sessions going on with Con Con Confederation of Indian Industry, with Pakistan Business Council, which is a similar pattern created in Pakistan. And one of the things we found out at that point in time was the non-trade barriers in India were much higher. While we were discussing, things started going worse once again. Uh, at this point in time, there is an issue. There's no question about that. Uh, the issue is that, um, again, the Kashmir issue. And let me tell you, Pakistanis are less obsessed about India as I, I see Indian television. It's incredible. I'm stunned at times. Mr. Modi's government uh, has taken it to another level. It's not that he wants to create these problems for Pakistan. He has a view of life. He has a view on Pakistan. He and the government itself. 
Uh, you can't find a better prime minister for India-Pakistan dialogue than Nawaz Sharif. He's absolutely committed to it. Not only is he committed to it, the entire political leadership or relevant political leadership of Pakistan would love to have a good relationship. But Nawaz Sharif takes it to another level. He wants to create that economic relationship with India. It might take a few more years. It might take a decade. That's why I kept repeating for Afghanistan. I kept repeating India because India is relevant. I kept repeating India's name on SEO because of Pakistan, India, bilateral issues can be discussed. And a little bit of to your issue on China, why they're not going to. India would not like us to go to Kashmir on United Nations. They said this is a personal matter. We did it on a bilateral basis. So big powers like India and big powers like China cannot be intimidated to take it to a multilateral problems. So it's absolutely the same reaction of China, which India has on Kashmir. But having said that, despite all the complexity, Pakistan will develop once they start trading fully with India. There is no question about that. But the problem with Pakistan has been, we don't trade with India because of the situation. People don't let us trade, or countries don't let us trade with Iran. Afghanistan, there is not much to trade it. God bless China is there so we can trade and have investments. Charlie, maybe let me, let me add just one point uh, on this question. By the way, I've lived in Singapore for seven years. I write for your paper from time to time, right? So I, I, see, I see both views. I think, I think it's an absolutely fair question to ask yeah. ourselves or other people whether a particular dispute should be settled multilaterally or bilaterally or yeah. with three or four countries. I think that's absolutely fair, right? But to assume a problem is necessarily better handled multilaterally exactly. And then take that to a moral judgment to say this is about rule of law or no, not rule of law, I think are two steps too far, in my view, <laughs> right? Because I think it's absolutely fair for Singapore or other countries to say our view is this particular problem is better goes for multilateral. That's fair. But assume that's truth and to say, oh, this is a moral problem. Look at this country. They don't follow the international court. It's just too far, which is why the problem has to be. No, I think, I, I think I'm echoing what um, Professor Yan made well, on trade issues, for example. I think trade is one of the flows that is probably most developed in terms of what mechanisms are in place and what multilateral system you can solve issues. But I don't think there's any other flows, including the territory dispute, you have that completely established system. Therefore, I think you've got to deal with it case by case and then argue based on each dispute rather than, like some countries, taking it all into a moral judgment. Yeah. I think that doesn't help at all. It's a, it's a practical self-interest of countries, find the best way to solve the problem. It's not a moral judgment of these guys are, are you know, out, out of their mind. They, they, they don't follow international laws, yes. to me. OK, so we have lots of other questions. Um, Charlie, can I just come in to build on very, that? Very, very briefly. Very, because, very yeah, briefly okay. from a development perspective, it's okay. interesting to hear some of the you know, conversa conversation turning a little bit more towards you know, competition and uh, uh, na national interest. You asked you know, AIIB, US-China relationship. From a development perspective, if we start to see more and more competition, polarization, including in things like the South-South Fund or USAID or the Department for International Development, we're not going to get that inclusive growth that this forum is tasked with discussing, right? We're not going to achieve that. So we need these partnerships. We need the mechanisms for collaboration. We need that trust and we need the sharing. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to push back a little bit um, on what Professor Yen said earlier. I think it's critical in the case of the South China Sea to understand that there are two types of disputes, um, at least two types of disputes there. The first one is the land dispute. Who owns these land features in the South China Sea? The second one is about maritime entitlements. And that involves identifying what, what each feature in the South China Sea is um, whether it's an island or rock or a low tide elevation, and the maritime entitlements that this generates. This latter issue is governed by so the So is United this a question? Or yes, it is. This, okay. this, um, 
This latter issue is governed by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which, chi um, which China signed on to in 1996. Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there is a compulsory dispute resolution mechanism um, which entails binding decisions. And so for China now to say that, oh, it's about whether it's better resolved um, on a multilateral basis or a bilateral basis, that's legitimate if no other party decides to that you know, the negotiations have broken down and that it needs to be resolved by a third party dispute resolution mechanism. So could you just help me understand how China can claim both to be a law abiding nation and also then just neglect to, um, to submit itself to an agreement that it, 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 it um, signed up to in 1996? Thank you. We are getting a little bit off topic of one but one road here. So uh, maybe <laughs> you can keep it, your answer quite succinct. Okay, if you want uh, me to answer the, uh, very briefly, I think uh, China clearly stated that China will want to solve the problem according to the law. The question is that, and if the other countries do not uh, uh, behave themselves or conduct their foreign policy and uh, inconsistent law, violent the law, what we, we should do? Should we punish them or not? And actually, if you look at this uh, situation in this region, a lot of things and like this gentleman yesterday used the term, triggered by the countries, not China. And when these countries trigger the problems, the, the local media in this country are very silent. And when they claim that the China deploys the military equipment on these islands closer to the uh, countries, I wonder whether they know, understand every country has the right, and uh, according to the internet law, to deploy the to deploy the, tr uh, the troops and the equip military equipment on their own territory. So for instance, like uh, take Singapore, for example. And no matter where and, uh, Singapore deploys its troops or, or the equipment on this territory, it's uh, very close to Malaysia. Can we regard it as a, as a threat to the, this country? And because they're very close, can you identify this, uh, whether a weapon can pose a threat to this country by distance only? I doubt. And that's, uh, from my understanding, that's, uh, that's, mean, that's a kind of understanding. It means that they do not understand the military. Yeah, we, is this about one by one road, can I ask? <laughs> <laughs> yes? I think this is a question related to whether, as an Asia, you have a confidence about the world big trend going to force industrial revolution, but also equal civilization change. As an Asia, as a senior minister, Lee Kuan Yew, you know, always advocate Asia value. In North America, there is North American value. EU, there is an EU value. Britain is a Britain value. We understand each other. Unfortunately, I'm a constant reader of a Straight Times, but now I reduce that. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm the one that brings the name of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew to China to have the largest opening projects in China, Suzhou Industrial Park. Okay, but recently we have seen that Canadian opened a map that is the most famous American authoritarian publication of the maps. That is the company of Rand McNally. The map entitled is Atlas and the Gazette. In 1947, so famous map opened by Canadian. That is to say, South China Sea belongs to China. At that time, China's government is a Kuomintang, headed by Chiang Kai-shek. But now it's changed. OK, so when we solve the problem, I think that number one, I will ask straight times, it's better bilaterally. Right? If it is within Asia, it's better Asia, right? Do we have a confidence of the Asia in the 21st century to contribute to the world, work together with the EU and the United States, and also African, so as to create a future of ours, the 21st century, right? So this is a serious question. We are now in World Economic Forum. Do we trust ourselves, or we still lose our confidence do we have a consistency and a continuity policy? I'm also created one of the 10 plus one education week. 
now become very large in the ASEAN with China. So this is my question to all of you, especially you moderator. Okay. Yeah, you, you believe that Asia is a major driving factor and Asia is also a contributor to this world. You believe that Asia would like to join hands with North America, European, Africa, and Latin America. We do not forget the past history, but now we're looking forward. This world, how can we maintain the world within two degrees centigrade before, four, before the first industrial revolution? I just have a meeting with President Macron and COP21 president, Laurent Fabius in, Fabris, in Paris. So we think that we should work together. Thank you. Uh, well, I hope that Asia is a driver for the world because I live here now. So um, would you like to respond to that at all? Well, you want to uh, come back to the one by one road? Well, no, well, still okay. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone have a question about one by one road, please? Uh, <laughs> so if it, it may be in the back there. <laughs> Hi, I think uh, Professor Tan and as well as David uh, made a specific uh, differentiation to say that this is more of a global, a new manifestation of globalization and that it's a regional connectivity project. Uh, could you explain the uh, political and strategic implications of the BRI and also what are the uh, domestic capacities within the various countries, particularly the economic capacity of these countries on the Belt and Road, uh, road route to absorb, and are they particularly referring to the repayment issues in a sense? Many of the countries have had a problem of debt issues and kind of things. So if either of you could explain to, uh, that'll be great. Thank you. So who was that question directed to? Uh, David and uh, Prosea. Yeah. OK. But David first. Um, is that to start? So who was it? Sorry? You addressed two person. OK, is it Kevin? Yeah. Okay, to Kevin, sorry. sorry I, 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 I didn't really get the question. <laughs> did, you, 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 did you understand okay, the question? Okay, very brief. Okay. And uh, actually, I, uh, you know, when we hold this summit, uh, one by one road, and a lot of people uh, misunderstand China has uh, too much money to spend, so they're looking for the place. <laughs> mm. <laughs> actually, I think that's misunderstanding. And I don't think we have enough resources, or the, I mean the financial resources support all of the project uh, on one by one road. And so China actually looking for the joint venture. And I still want to emphasize that. This is a cooperation, this is a joint venture, this is a joint program. If it's not joint program, you cannot guarantee, guarantee the win-win game. And the unilateral investment will run the risk of the failure and the bankrupt. And uh, 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 so for, for that way, I think the, if the, uh, any country and already in, uh, involved in this uh, uh, idea, and they should concern what kind of uh, efforts that they can provide for this joint venture. Certainly some country, like uh, this uh, uh, lady said that, and they do not have capital to uh, support this. And, but then they can support these projects with the, uh, 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 policy. And from understanding policy, sometimes it's more important than capital. And in any country, and if you can have a supporting policy, you can uh, benefit from it economically. So that's from understanding that every country involved in this uh, should concern that what they can contribute to the joint venture rather than rely on the uni uh, China's uh, efforts only. Yeah. Okay. Can I Charlie, if I yeah. just, just make Someone one, had your yeah, yeah, yeah. one addition to that, that question, if I understood it correctly, is you know, what's the fastest growing economy in the world? It's Ethiopia, right? Mm -hmm. So does a country like Ethiopia have the capacity to absorb some of that investment? Absolutely it does, and I think there are many, many other, uh, other examples right now. Can I also, uh, yes, please. Bit, just to, uh, from Pakistani perspective, again, because CPAC is the flagship, 35 billion out of 45 billion, as I said, are the power projects. These are all relevant power projects. There is a yawning gap between what is being produced and what Pakistan needs, so there is a need for that. Number two, Pakistan said we want this. China didn't come and dictate it. One example of the company that I represent, Engro Board, it's a world-class company. The Chinese are in minority. The Chinese company is in minority of these 330 into 2 megawatt projects and the coal mining project where Engro is involved. It's a world-class implementation taking place. Chinese are helping, but we are providing our side management experience that we have. So I have absolutely no doubt in the capacity of these projects and some of the others that I know of the repayment capacity. So we're running out of time, but we maybe 
can I take one more question. Okay. Yeah. I'm the minister in charge of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So referring to, you know, just if you will allow me to make one comment that every project in CPAC or OBOR is evaluated on the principles of scientific planning and economic viability. So if it does not pass these two tests, yeah. this project is not considered for financing. So every project must clear the requirement of being financially and economically viable, as well as based on the principles of scientific planning. So OBOR or CPAC are not like development assistance programs where grants are being doled out uh, to do projects in charity. So these are based on mutual consultation mutual need and on win-win principles, Absolutely. so every project is a viable project. Absolutely. Um, and I suppose we hope that that due diligence applies for all of the One Belt One Bird projects across the globe. Um, I think that's a nice note to end with, so uh, can, please can you thank our panelists for a fascinating discussion today. Thank you.